I guess I don't need the mic. I'm mic'd already. Hello, I'm Peter Tenhagen. I'm with PPG Industries, um, also known as Hanging Ten, apparently. Uh, the problem is I've, I've known Smart Ops since its inception, so I probably have water skied on the Allegheny with some of the people uh, with Smart Ops maybe back in the day. So I, I now come to you actually as a customer and a user of, of Smart Ops, and uh, we implemented Smart Ops in 2010, we actually started the proof of value uh, in 2009. I was, I'm going to try and show you the journey we went through. So in general, I'll talk about PPG and then talk about our challenges, our approach, and then get into a little more detail in terms of some of the business cases we, we've had across our two and a half years with Smart Ops. Now, the perspective I'm going to come from is both from a a person who actually uses the software, because my, my day job is I'm in charge of operations, supply chain, and manufacturing for our automotive roof finish business. It's about a $2 billion business globally uh, where we manufacture in supply chain and do a lot of cross-sourcing globally of our products, uh, some of our paint products that I'll talk about. But my other job is to be the sponsor of Smart Ops across the company. Uh, specifically with our project and our performance coatings business, and now uh, we're moving it forward more to a, a, from a project to a program within the business. So we'll talk through some of the cases of, of, of Smart Ops in terms of what we've learned thus far, and I'm going to get a little more detail. I'm going to be more of a perspective of you as a project leader trying to justify the case as well as what's your approach going into it and what did we learn going through that? So I was in this in your seat a couple of years ago. I learned a lot from everybody else that had gone through this. I'm trying to say this presentation is about what you guys wanted to hear or what I wanted to hear when I was in your shoes. And then we'll talk about where we're going in terms of the future of Smart Ops, get into lesson learned. And uh, between myself and our team of PPG, we've got Thomas, Chris, and Mary, and Lisa. We've, we can answer a lot of the questions about our various implementations. So let me get started. What is PPG Industries? We're n we didn't really sponsor lunch because people don't really want to have paint around there. Uh, we didn't sponsor any of the meals, so I'm sorry. Maybe we'll give you some paint samples next time. Um, but in general, we are primarily B2B. Most of we are primarily a coatings business, and we've just taglined ourselves in terms of we are bringing innovation to the surface. And that applies to both our glass businesses, our chemicals businesses, and also our, our coatings businesses. And I'll talk about uh, our culture, but we are very decentralized. We've got 12 different business units in six different segments, and each is empowered to, to make their own decisions. So it's, it's not a one theme company. We don't have a lot of central organizations. And actually, that's one of the challenges we came across when we were trying to implement Smart Ops, something that could apply to multiple business units and trying to implement that across a very decentralized infrastructure. But the company is based in Pittsburgh, so that's also a good thing. You know, I can, we can walk across the street over to Smart Ops. Um, we, we know the players, and uh, that's actually one of the big things of why we, why we chose Smart Ops. Um, we are a global company. We are in 60 different countries, manufacturing or over uh, 170 different manufacturing facilities globally. And we are making a lot of the products you don't see, but you see it on the end products that you use. $15 billion company, and it's spread across these different segments. You'll see that the little pie chart kind of shows kind of the, the, our total sales in terms of how they're broken out across these different segments. We strategically, over the last several years, our CEO has really been trying to drive us more into the coding space. So we've divested from some of our glass business. We used to make the, the glass for automotive, automobiles, you know, your windshields and stuff in the, in the automotive industry. We've divested from that business. Uh, we have a chemicals business that we just announced. We are actually going to sell that in the first quarter, our commodity chemicals business, where we're making uh, chlorine or, and a chloroalkali product that goes into PVC pipe. We'll be divesting in that. So strategically, at the end of the first quarter, 95% of our sales will be in either coatings or optical businesses, 
and then we'll still have 5% of our sales in our glass business. I, did, I will go through, and you'll, you'll see these little pictures on the side showing some of the different end-to-end -end use applications, and I'll, I'll kind of go through these businesses in a little more detail, especially the performance coatings businesses. Uh, architectural coatings, that is our term for house paint. So if you go to Lowe's, you get Olympic paint, Olympic stain, Porter paints, uh, Pittsburgh paints. It's just house paint, uh, various applications of it. Through that business, we actually have 1,150 stores globally that we, we run those retail store operations. And I'll tell you about some of the challenges we've had trying to implement smart ops in, into our network. Uh, so that was definitely a, a challenge. But that's one of our retail-facing operations. Uh, protective and marine coatings. We make protective coatings for, say, bridges. We, we paint bridges for something in a very caustic environment, as well as uh, marine coatings. And I was talking to Captain Mike again. We're the guys who actually make the paint for the ship. And I'm a former Navy officer. I was one of those department heads that had to go tell the captain about the problems, and I was responsible for painting the ship, and I didn't really like it, but actually now I do, now that we make the paint. So we're, <laughs> I think we're gonna come up with a program now to have the military go back to Ferris fittings, you know, to, to really spark our PMC business. So we'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. But that's our protective marine coatings business. We have our aerospace business, and aerospace, they pretty much do everything for an airplane. We make the windshields, we do the coatings, uh, we also do the sealants. So when you put it all together, it's gotta be lightning proof. Uh, we have a lot of sealants that all these little seal caps go on, on the airplane. We've got about a, over a million dollars in every Dreamliner that goes out. So we've got a lot of products go, that go into uh, aircraft. Um, and by the way, we like when Continental got bought by United and they had to repaint everything and oh, we love that business. So it's, uh, so we'll just have them keep buying each other. That works for us. Uh, automotive refinish, that's the business that I'm, that I'm uh, associated with. I'm responsible for the operations there. We sell paint to uh, body shops for uh, car repair. So we like when it hails, we like snow, we like accidents. When you guys bang your car up, we like that a lot. So you get your, your fender fixed up, and then you spray our paint on afterwards. So we keep running into things. Thank you. Um, industrial coatings, we have uh, our automotive coatings group. They're putting p paint onto the car at the car manufacturers. So in a GM plant, you may have seen some of the commercials where the metal car, the just raw metal goes into the dip tank. It gets a nice protective coating, and then it then eventually a, a, a couple other layers of paint, then it's baked on, and then it's, it's shot out the door. You may not see rusty cars like I used to see when I was, when I was younger because of this process. The eco process that was developed by PPG actually has really sealed in and contained uh, the metal, and you don't see as much, much rust in vehicles like you did back in the 70s and 60s, and I'm dating myself by saying how long I've gone back to see rusty cars. But that's the automotive coatings process. And the refinish business just handles it after it's been uh, sent out uh, into the industry or into the world. Industrial coatings. Industrial coatings is kind of a catch-all. It's like uh, for your iPad, the, the coating on the back of the iPad could be, you know, we, were, we try and do that for phones and other things. Uh, general applications, if you're selling to OEMs, it's more of a B2B. You're selling some uh, motor manufacturer. They just want to put a paint paint coat on their on their product. That's that's who we supply. So they've got they're kind of the catch-all about nine different segments. But they any type of coating we are in that space and it's usually covered by industrial coatings, packaging coatings. Uh, those are all those cool Coke cans you're drinking out of. You know that red paint on the outside. That's our packaging coatings paint. The resin that's in the inside of the of the can that protects you from the corrosive materials of the metal or corrosion in the metal, that's our packaging coating paint. So you don't, you don't see our products, but they're in there. They're, they're in the products that you use. Uh, architectural MIA, I'll, I'll mention this because this is kind of linked with our strategy. We've been growing uh, the business significantly 
and trying to actually get away from just being a North America-based based company. Even we're headquartered in Pittsburgh, we're really trying to grow globally, trying to diversify ourselves. We acquired uh, the Sigma Kalon business for about $3.2 billion in 2008. That's a, about a, architectural me is about a $2 billion revenue uh, business in itself. It is house paint, but it's within Europe. EMEA, I'm sorry if I'm using PPG slang, but Europe, Middle East, and Africa. But that's got a very strong presence there, had a very strong protective marine business, as well as a strong presence in Asia Pacific. So in the, in the regions we wanted to grow in, that was a great acquisition. Now coming with that, they're an SAP shop, and we are not SAP, and we're kind of a hodgepodge of systems, I'll explain that later. But that's what we get into through these acquisitions. We've had a lot of small paint companies that we've acquired, and we end up just having to deal with all the various systems and processes and people uh, associated with that. Optical and special materials. This is another one of our products that, um, that you may know as a, as a consumer. Uh, we make transitions lenses. So the photochromatic lenses that when you go outside, they turn dark, they turn into uh, sunglasses, but when you come back inside, they, they are a normal tint. Uh, so the, we actually that was, took it from R&D to startup of that technology all the way through to marketing, and now we are the market leader in that, in that industry. So Transitions is, is a very important product for us that we have a good partnership with the, the lens, lens manufacturer on that. Commodity chemicals, as I said, it's a, more of our chloralkali business um, and other commodity materials, a good cast generator for us, but that is something strategically where be, we'll be divesting. And glass, we have a very strong presence and history in glass for construction glass and also uh, uh, fiberglass. So in general, that's, that's PPG. Now, with regard to smart ops and our story, I'm gonna talk more from the performance coatings perspective. That's where we started our journey only because that's the business I was in. So we said, I actually knew the smart ops folks. I got into PPG in around uh, 2007. I was in, this in the architectural business. We called smart ops, talked to JR, and it said, you know, I know what you guys do. We have a problem for you. Let's get this conversation started. And eventually, we got the ear of the person in charge of performance coatings, and we said, this thing can apply to, to everybody. Let's see how we can do the proof of concept within this segment. And we said, yes, it works. Let's move forward. And so our initial journey was really just in performance coatings. So that's what we're calling phase one. Then we invited someone from the industrial coatings group to the forum. He's like, this stuff is really cool. Let me bring it back to my business. And now all of a sudden automotive coatings is, is implementing and, and moving forward. Now we've since gone with the global enterprise license across all PPG. It's not applicable to everybody, but we are now licensed for it globally. And now we're working with some of these other businesses that haven't started the journey to move forward uh, for their next stage of the journey. So let me, let me step back and, and walk you through this timeline. First thing was 2008, the economy was, was going down. There was a big opportunity within PPG uh, to help us improve our management of the supply chain. I, I will say when we, we look at the whether we're laggards in the supply chain or whether we're leaders, we were even before laggards, okay? We weren't really there. Supply chain wasn't necessarily a focus at PPG, and I said that in the forum last year. It's, it, just, it just wasn't something that was core to, to our business. We're very strong on the growth, very strong on the manufacturing, but management of inventory and also planning, that, that wasn't as integrated as we would like. So there was, a, there was a great opportunity for us. Working capital management really wasn't a focus also. So then Wall Street tells us, saying, well, relative to your peers, you're not really investing your working capital, your cash as well as your peers. So our working capital as a percentage of sales was much higher than our peers of Sherwin and AXO and all these other uh, coatings companies. And so there was a lot of push from the top to say, really need to focus on working capital. So we formed a supply chain council. Actually, I had to define what supply chain was. 
had to take all these different business units and bring, bring the supply chain leaders, which most of them were people who just run manufacturing plants, um, and try to bring this concept of supply chain to the business. So it's been a progression. Uh, we've moved along, and we're, we're, we're getting there, but you know, we're not where we aspire to be. And I love Bob's presentation. I just wish I could be up here in five years saying the same things he's doing. Uh, but we're not there yet. Uh, but the opportunity was identified, and we saw this is the opportunity to take a look at smart ops. Smart ops can help us, especially on, on some of the businesses, to really put in a systematic approach as opposed to counting on, on, the, on the people trying to solve these problems because we didn't have the people. Or if they, we had the people, they were putting out fires because we didn't have as many good processes. So let's try to, try to take a look at how we can bring uh, a tool like this into, into our environment. So in 2009, we actually put a team together and said, let's evaluate IO and let's evaluate the different vendors and say, who should we be talking to? What should we do? What's the opportunity? Frame the opportunity. And for us, and for me specifically, there was a lot of pre-selling to, to management and all the general managers of these different businesses, first defining what supply chain is and defining what IO is and, and trying to tell the story and say, there's an opportunity here to manage our inventory better. And a lot of it was just like, OK, it's faith. you know. OK, I, it sounds good, but show me the numbers. So we'll at least get it started. So we did a proof of concept at the end of 2009. So where we did the protective marine coatings, the refinish, and the architectural business, we did that in 2009. Then after the proof of concept, we said, this stuff actually works. You know, the, the savings were palpable. It was, a, it was around 30% savings. JR, we, I told JR to tone it down and just say 15% savings. Uh, in the presentation, and then when we presented our actual ACT, we said six to seven percent, just like everybody else in this room. So we actually uh, got the got the project approved. Uh, we actually went through a full RFQ. We went through. We looked at Legility. Uh, actually, it was Optian at the time, and like two days prior to our meeting with Optian, they had just gotten bought by Legility, and so everything was a mess. Anyway, it was just weird timing of the RFQ. Uh, but we also looked at Oracle, because we're a very strong Oracle shop, but they just didn't, didn't have the solution. SmartOps had the solution. And the, there were a lot of reasons why we chose SmartOps. Um, so we, we then mo moved forward, got the project approved, and we actually started the project in July of 2010 and had built out the in started building the infrastructure to, to move it forward. So I'll talk quickly about. 2011 in terms of, okay, we started our business implementation, did a lot of roll-ins, and we started attending the forums and started really learning from other customers of, of what experience they've had in their journey. Uh, we adopted a lot of these principles, the center of expertise, uh, trying to build a team, uh, getting other businesses on board, and then eventually we went, by the end of 2011, we had enough uh, of, a, of a success to say, let's move forward with this global enterprise license. So that's going to end in 2011. So Thomas and I, when we were putting this presentation together, we said, let's, let's kind of reflect. Let's reflect of where we were when we started this project and, and how did this, what did we assume and how does this journey go? So the first thing was, to smart ops, we said, look, we're different. We're not an SAP shop. We are global. We are completely decentralized. We have, for this performance coatings group, we have 14 different autonomous businesses. So when we talk about uh, the refinish business in North America, it's different than the refinish business in Europe, than in Asia Pacific, and in Latin America. And we're all at different stages of our evolution of supply chain. Some are more established, some are not. So within that, we have 14 different business units that we're trying to imp implement. We have all different supply chains, so the architectural business was more of a B2C, but everyone else was more of a B2B. Some are focusing more on raw materials and, and WIP, like our aerospace business, and some are more, more focused on finished goods. All at different levels of maturity, different planning systems, a lot of different challenges. And I, I did want to talk more about the systems. 
when people say they're an SAP shop, I, I actually am a little envious because when Y2K came, we didn't get the memo. <laughs> we didn't get it. We didn't convert to one system. We didn't do any of that. We have a hodgepodge of systems. We have, we're working off a of tandem and EMIS and 30 year old systems in the US, uh, MFG Pro, uh, Infor, Datasoul, Oracle. Uh, we, have, we have three businesses chemicals, PMC, and this architecture OMEA on SAP. Um, and we've got all, not only when we're Oracle, we have so many different instances of Oracle that they don't even talk to one another. So it's not easy, and that's why we have more IT people at this meeting than we have business unit people. Uh, and so it's a challenge for Mary and Chris and, and Lisa and on, on all our implementation. So it's not easy from that perspective. The other thing is it's not easy from a global implementation standpoint. You've got a smart ops team that was a little more focused on on North America at the time. They've got some consultant help globally, but we're saying, hey, you gotta fly over to Europe and you gotta help us out and implement it over here. So we said, how do we actually approach this thing? How do we actually implement uh, in these different, these are the regions we need to go to, these are the business units we need to implement in. So we did take more of a, a regional approach where we have Say in Australia, we have one plant that makes for seven different business units. They make the paint for seven different business units. They've got a combined and centralized planning team. We said that's our regional center. We won't do it by business unit. We will just say we are going to implement smart ops here and not slice it by business unit. We'll slice it by region. So in Latin America, China, or China and Australia, we're going along those lines. But in the other regions, we were much more mature. We had unique special uh, planning organizations. We had unique implementations there. So it was a challenge because, just because of our, the nature of our organization. So we said, we're different, and by the way, let's do it all in two and a half years. So I've, uh, I've, we hired Thomas to actually implement this, and Thomas is on the road all the time doing all these different implementations, concurrent implementations is very much a project management challenge. When we came to the, to the forum, I, unfortunately it came after we had submitted the project and I realized I was way too aggressive from a timeline perspective and saying how can we try and do all this in this period of time given the, the journey that we've seen from, from other people in terms of their progression, in terms of how they've rolled it out across some of their businesses and especially given some of the challenges we've had so given that, we said, well, we need to make sure we've got a good project management infrastructure and processes in, in place. So we set up along the lines of, we, you know, Martin mentioned it earlier, we talk about people, talk about process and technology. So how did we approach this from a project perspective? First, we said, we've got different layers of, of owners throughout the business. How do we empower all the way down to the person in Latin America for refinish who's implementing this? So we had to actually set up a different hierarchy where we have the executive steering committee where you have the business owners from all these different unique businesses there and then, then we had different layers of the project team, then the super user group, then the center of expertise resource and then the super uh, the different business unit teams in terms of the implementation teams. Then from a process standpoint, it was really a lot of things. Uh, the one key thing I want to talk about here is cadence. Cadence of reporting, cadence of, of project management. If something happened, uh, we knew about it. It was, a, it was a weekly review with every single business unit, standard reporting, standard cadence. And I credit Thomas to, to making sure that was, that was being kept up because when you've got seven different concurrent implementations, uh, you just need to make sure you're staying on top of it. We tried to standardize that process in reporting, the value tracking, uh, the, the monitoring of, of where we are. You really needed to standardize that and talk the same language with everybody uh, throughout this process while you're trying to do a lot of things at once. Uh, we've also some things we standardize and some things we kind of let the business units kind of be creative with because you, you've got an empowered 
you know, we are, just like uh, uh, Captain Mike said, and also, uh, and Bob, we are working on a culture of engagement within PPG. Some businesses are further along, like our transitions business is very strong on that. We're trying to take that model and roll it out across the company. So from our perspective, we really tried to empower the teams to say, here's the tool, how do you best, best use it, um, and trying to get their input. And through that process, we found some good best practices of how to best uh, utilize things. So for example, we're using the ClickView tool in Europe. We found a good way to use that to do similar, something similar to AIM uh, within our, so we can get more business analytics and understand what's going on with the solution. So that's something that we'll then take and leverage and use across the other businesses. And from an information technology approach, we had to come up with a standard approach in terms of how information got fed into our systems because we had multiple ERPs fitting in and we could talk for a couple hours in terms of our IT challenges, but we really tried to standardize our approach there. So that was our approach and that's, that was our challenge. Um, I, I wanna get into some case studies. Uh, we, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna share with you three case studies talking about what we've learned, a lot of challenges really on change management and a lot of challenges uh, from a technology standpoint uh, to make this happen. So the first thing is, I'll choose one of my own businesses here. This is uh, Refinish in North America. Uh, the Refinish business, as I said, we, we make the paint. We've got one central manufacturing plant in the US. We have a central, very simple network design. We make to one central DC and we've got nine spoke DCs. Within that, you still have about 5,000 SKUs, um, but about 27,000 SKU locations. So that's kind of the complexity of the network. It's not, not as, as much as some of the other businesses, but that's relatively simple. Uh, we did want to focus, you can see our green circle. We said, let's just focus on finished goods only because when you look at all our businesses, refinish is more of a distribution business for like very high service, next day delivery requirements. Most of our inventory is really tied up in the finished goods. So that's the supply chain. Um, we would sell, you know, we sell our products to the end, to distribution, they sell it to the body shop. So in general, we're just focusing on what was within our realm. So we had a couple challenges. First, we had some manufacturing constraints before demand was strong and we liked that, but I didn't like it too much because my plant couldn't make enough. So we were getting yelled at uh, from customers because our service was just poor, more from a manufacturing constraint standpoint. So a lot of effort was done to improve on, on that, which we did, but a lot of pain, there was a lot of pain in this business. It's a very high touch business, very customer focused business. And when you start stocking out, uh, you lose a lot of credibility and we lost some credibility. And so there's a lot of pressure never to stock out. So it's not really the time to come in and say, let's lower our inventory. So from a change management perspective, we really weren't getting much buy-in from the team. The team was very well established. They'd all been there on average around 22 years of experience within that business unit and didn't really want to say, hey, let's, uh, let's start playing with safety stocks. All right. So this was a major challenge. So I, when I talk about refinish, I ask, you know, people on my team have heard this before. I say this. It, they're used to watching TV on a black and white, little small 13 inch screen. And then we've gone out with Smart Ops and we bought a flat screen, 60 inch color, just awesome TV. And we say, here you go. And they, during the implementation, they kept trying to tweak down Smart Ops till the screen was about 13 inches and it was black and white. And so that was our challenge. So they just didn't want things to be disrupted and saying, oh yeah, we'll take it because you're our boss and we will accept this. I'm trying to say, look, I think there's some better potential here. But they just tweaked it down to, to the small black and white. So our challenge was like, okay, we'll work with that. How do we get them over that hill, over that hump? So we actually worked with them. They set up a, a seven stage, stage gate process where every SKU had to eventually waterfall through this process of passing all these hurdles and eventually we'll get on to smart ops. And gradually, we eventually got them all on. 
not all of them, but uh, the ones where we had the biggest impact. And we're still working on some of the small volume ones. So it, it took longer than we thought, a lot more filters than we thought, but from a change management standpoint, now actually they're starting to tweak the screen a bit. They're going to 20 inches, they're starting to say, hey, this color thing's kind of cool. So they're starting to get there. You know, they had made certain assumptions. They say, look, minimum batch size, we're very batch driven. We make large batches of paint. Manufacturing loves to make very large batches of paint that last two years, and I'm always trying to say, let's EOQ, let's try to balance that with inventory. Um, they were saying batch size of one, and other tweaking the system, tweaking the parameters for their benefit to be more conservative. Now we're getting them off of that. So it'll be more of a gradual journey, but we did actually, we achieved our inventory target uh, because there was a lot of low-hanging fruit, and we, we did that in a year and a half. We still see a lot more potential in this business. So that's, uh, that's kind of where we are. We're over 50% of our SKU locations are using smart ops. So let's go to another case. Our aerospace business in Europe and the US, they are making, as I said, the coatings and sealants, and a lot of their business is, is done globally. Now I'll give you a little backstory on aerospace. Since aerospace wasn't part of the proof of concept, because we could only do three businesses, and we had four businesses that we implemented, they were pretty much told by their boss that, okay, you're gonna implement smart ops. So all of a sudden the general manager and the team in aerospace is pretty much like, I'm doing okay. I'm really good with inventory, I don't need smart ops, and it was a, pretty much a change man, management challenge from the top. So our challenge was we had a very skeptical general manager that we had to, we had to kind of prove, okay, you know, this, this thing actually does work. When you get down to and working with the teams, we had a lot of good buy-in. We had people who said, you know, I think we could improve our processes, we could really improve how we do things. Uh, so that was our, our way of okay, identifying, okay, where do we go first, and how do we get a good win such that we can communicate it? Uh, and that's where Europe seemed to be the best position. Um, so we chose to go into Europe. We chose a relatively simple supply chain. Uh, if you, our aerospace business, we make uh, big drums of paint, and then we take it to um, uh, what we call an application service center. We take the big thing of paint and kind of put it into smaller containers that we then are, and our application service centers are like right next to Boeing or Airbus. And sometimes we put, put the paint in a little pen that after they clean up the paint and they, or they scratch it, they can take the pen and just kind of clean it up. Uh, so you're taking, there's a lot of kind of value added in manufacturing being done at the very end. Uh, but more of the inventory is really in raw materials or whip uh, in more of these drums, drums of paint. So it's a matter of managing that supply chain. Uh, so we have one global plant for the sealants and two local coatings plants because in our business, we don't like shipping a lot of water, which is there's a lot of water in paint. So you want to make sure your manufacturing is local. Uh, we have five warehouses throughout Europe and multiple application uh, support centers but a lot less complexity in terms of uh, supply chain design, but a little more focus. This is where it's more raw material and whip focused. It's not just finished goods. So what are the challenges? As a, we had, in some cases, they weren't doing statistical forecasting. You know, they were saying, oh, this, you know, I, this is what I get from the system, but this is actually how I'm gonna produce. So we had to somehow capture that data come up with a way in, in the US, we actually said, Let's, why don't you buy a demand planning solution? So you know, these are things you run into when you all of a sudden go to Asia and Singapore and, and other regions. You run into a bunch of these challenges. They had two different systems that weren't talking to one another. So how could we actually take smart ops and take all this data and then look system wide? That was one of the challenges. Uh, but we did, from an implementation standpoint, we had just done some work with the automotive uh, team in Europe. We had done some good interface work with them. We used the same application. We really leveraged that, as well as uh, uh, some of the tools in ClickView. We really got some good buy-in uh, based on some of the things we had learned through our, our other applications. 
And we really started with a small amount of SKUs and then said, okay, we'll then kind of grow it. So currently we actually just went live, we're in production. Uh, and even with a small set of SKUs and less than 10% of all their active stocking locations, they, print, they hit their inventory target. So there was money to be had, there was an opportunity to be had, and now we've gotten a little more, uh, my conversations with the GM are a little better. So we say, okay, yes, this actually does work. Now they're saying to me, when can we get it into the US? When can we move this forward? So it's, it's been less of a pushing the rope and more of a pulling, and that's, that's kind of what our intention was. So let me talk also, okay, third case study is North America architectural. You can see in the, in the top some of the paint, you know, Olympic paints, Pittsburgh paint, Porter paints. This one is a very complex supply chain. So we're talking about eight plants in the US, 20 distribution centers or plant warehouses, um, 420 retail stores, and a lot of customers in three different channels. So we sell to the big box retailers of Lowe's, you sell it to the mom and pop hardware short shops also, and you also sell through our own retail stores. So very complex supply chain. Um, our challenge here was the complexity. So when we said, okay, let's just look at our warehouse network first, that's about 18,000 SKUs, or SKU locations, that was manageable. But then when all of a sudden you go to our store network, we're talking about 256,000, and can we process and optimize those all in a good time? So a lot of talk on, with, with the IT group on performance and runtime of the optimization, that's where our biggest challenge, challenge occurred. And just to put in smart ops ease, that's our little model, and that's just out of one distribution center going to the stores. So add that to 20, and you'll see the complexity. That's why we needed the tool. We also had uh, two different systems the stores group was working on one system. The warehouse group was working on another. We weren't optimal between us. We had a false internal service level target between the stores or the warehouses to the stores. So there's a lot of opportunity to be had from an inventory standpoint. We were double, we just had too much. We didn't know how much to stock at the stores or how much to stock at the warehouse. That's where, that's what prompted our conversation with, with smart ops to say there's a better solution here. So we actually implemented this in two phases, more from a software timing standpoint. We implemented the warehouse network first, got some good savings there that was, we saw, we fixed the mix and actually we didn't see that much of a bump change in, in inventory, but our service bumped up by a point from a line fill rate standpoint. So it was a good win there. Uh, then we started going into the stores and we're still, we're not live yet with the stores. We're still trying to work on, a, finalizing what is our retail service requirement. How do you measure service uh, to the customer? They walk into the store, they walk out. It's not like they're saying, I wanted this line, this line, this line, here's my line fill rate. So that's our challenge. We've been working with uh, many of you in the room and as well as the Smart Ops team to really understand what should we be measuring and how do we do that. And then we'll have a benchmark of service that we can optimize the inventory to. But in general, the uh, Warehouse network, I'll, I'll go back to the TV from a change management perspective. When we bought them the new flat screen, 60 inch, they said this is awesome, put it on, and they threw out the black and white. So they went on completely after it first, you know, once they turned it on, they said it was working, they turned all their, all their SKU locations on. So you have different change management challenges depending on the culture of that particular business. So that's what we're dealing with, it's not like We've got all these different business units all kind of doing the same thing. They're all at different stages of supply chain knowledge and, and advancement. The one other thing I will talk about, we did develop a center of expertise I'll go into. Um, we use that, uh, Lisa, for the stores implementation. So in terms of where we are, currently across uh, these 14 business units we initially targeted, eight are live. And we've got three more that are ready to go live by year end. So that's kind of where we are. We've only achieved 30% of our initial inventory target, but we're just over the edge on a couple of businesses and, and we are moving forward. We've got a common technology platform installed in terms of receiving that, uh, our, our interfaces and using that within SmartOps. And we've got an infrastructure now of 
a super user community and we've got an infrastructure to build upon for future. future. So thinking of the future, we said, well, let's think about from a people and processing technology, how should we take this from a project to a program? I like how, how Bob kind of had uh, shown that in his presentation. We started as a project and now we've got to set up a long-term program. So that's where the user group really came in handy for us. We talked to a lot of people here saying, we're going to move forward, how do we do this? So from a people standpoint, we're moving in the direction of building a center of expertise uh, as opposed to trying to require this pretty specific skill set to be cloned and put into every single region and every single business unit and to try and actually keep those people, especially since we had a lot of turnover, even of our project team. So we really had to focus on, strategically, we're going to go more towards the COE model. From a process standpoint, we're really trying to leverage what, what some best practices were and also kind of make sure we go back afterwards and say, let's expand our supply chains and also do more what-if scenarios. So really take supply chain to the next level. Don't just say, okay, I'm all done with smart ops. I got it implemented and saying, you can go further and taking examples of what we've seen of other businesses, other companies doing that. From an information technology standpoint, we've seen some other things where we're trying to get data into more of a central approach, more central as opposed to one-on-one -on -one kind of connectivity. And so we can look at things like a global business. We can look more globally of how do we optimize our global supply chain and do, do some other um, things along those lines. And really trying to expand into other business units as we move forward. So if, if architectural works here, our next move is to go to Europe for architectural MIA. We're gluttons for punishment. They've got another 500 some stores and in multiple countries, twice the size as our architectural US business, but that'll be our upcoming challenge. So what did we learn with smart ops? First, make sure you allow enough time for the implementation. That's something we learned. We, we thought it would be a shorter period of time. We thought we'd have a lot of lessons learned, which we did, but there's certain fixed time components that are required no matter what size of business. Uh, so if a little small, uh, $2 million inventory business versus something that's got $180 million, you still have to go through a lot of the same steps. Make sure you put enough time in. We did a lot of, we changed our approach to do a lot more prep work to get people up to speed in advance. So more education, getting them the tools in advance so they knew the terminology before all of a sudden we brought in the smart ops team for the kickoff. And that was something that uh, we learned through this process. The other thing is business readiness assessments. Is your business ready for smart ops? Uh, we learned our, the hard way by saying, okay, this one business in the US didn't have statistical forecasting or they weren't using it. We didn't know until we actually got too far down the road. Uh, is there enough inventory reduction justification to actually implement, you know, go through the costs of an implementation. So we started with 14 business units targeted only because that was the permutations and combinations. Three of them were pretty much saying it doesn't really make sense. Like protective marine Latin America, it's too small to even try to go through this. So it's gotta, it's gotta work. And your supply chain has to be complex enough to make sure it actually works uh, for that business. So we developed a business readiness assessment approach where we would evaluate that business before we move forward and start allocating resources. Also from a center of expertise, we really put in a, a lot of time uh, to try to minimize the turnover risk. We've got Lisa Vincente here. She's our first COE. We're trying to build upon that. We thought that was a better model uh, than counting on people within the business, and also we had turnover of uh, smart ops resources as well as our own resources through the project. We really try to build that center uh, within your team and try to, try to maintain that knowledge within the, how, within the company. Value tracking was a challenge. Everyone had a different system. We were trying to say, how do you actually, you know, looking back, okay, what did smart ops gain us? Is it worth what we paid for it? That's what this the C-suite wants to understand. Because you're about to go back to them saying, okay, well, I want you to buy AIM, I want you to buy PPPO, I want you to do all this. They're gonna say, well, is this thing actually saving us money? Or 
How do you distinct, think, distinctly pull that out from all these other initiatives you're doing? Was it smart ops or you, the fact that you actually have an SNOP process and your accuracy improved? So you really gotta, you gotta come up, we had to come up with a, and put a lot of work into evaluation or value tracking and service baseline so we can say this is where we were and this is where we are going forward. And this is what the impact was of smart ops. From an IT standpoint, we really had to know the risks of the interfaces and system performance, and that was really just us just understanding the complexity of our IT environment and how, wow, we should have addressed this years ago, but now we're dealing with it. So it's just like us trying to put in SAP from the get-go. We're learning this through a much smaller team and not a full huge uh, consultant group going in to bring these interfaces all together. We really had to do, make sure you do a lot more planning, and we're doing a lot more planning up front now uh, before going into the implementations. And ongoing support, that's key. This isn't a drop and go. This isn't just something you just put in and say, okay, it's, it's, that's fine. Okay, we did smart ops, let's poop, move back. Make sure you plan for resources going forward uh, to make sure this is supported to get the best value and maintain the best value. Standardized deployments, really trying to make sure however we uh, implemented it was consistent and then we can leverage from one another. And really the last point I want to say is like it does work. It does work, we've achieved savings, we're not to our goal yet, but we're, we've achieved it thus far. It's a journey, smart ops is a journey. It's not a quick win, but you gotta stay the course and just kinda keep moving forward, but keep plugging away. Keep staying the course and it will work for you. So with that said, I, I'm open to any questions you have. Yes? For the center of excellence, did you use more IT staff or did you get resources for business reassigned? It was from our IT organization because most of our challenges on the implementation were more from an IT perspective. But there's the challenge with a COE resource is trying to find someone who knows IT but also knows supply chain and then can look at the model and say, hey, that's not right from a supply chain perspective, but know how to get that information into, into the system. So it's a, very, it's a unique uh, skill class that it's tough to find. Uh, just to repeat what Mary said, uh, Lisa has an industrial engineering background, so I think that, that combination of that training, education, and supply chain, as well as IT has been helpful for us. Thank you, Lisa. Any other questions? Yes, Elliot. Right here. When we were very general when we, when we took a look at the ACT or the capital of request. We said we expect X percent reduction of finished goods and X percent reduction of raw materials and WIP. And we just said let's apply that across all the business units that we're going forward with. So we were much more general. But then once you go into that supply chain, you see how complex it is. You know where the inventory resides. Uh, we just would then focus really where on the core inventory resides, and our plan is to kind of move downstream. So refinish in Europe, they just said, hey, let's do raw materials and WIP also when we optimize. As I said, refinish USCA, it was more of a change management challenge. We said, let's not bite off too much. Let's just focus on finished goods within their warehouse network, something simple that we can get get past, and then we'll move, move out. There's an, another question on the left. Uh, the question was, when we did our architectural business, we had our warehouse network and DC network, and then we have the stores network. Uh, when we look at where we see the biggest opportunity, we see 
it once we implement the stores. So when we first did the DCs, it was a small amount of inventory savings. It was more of a service perspective, like fixing the mix. But where we see the savings is doing the true multi-echelon, because we are on two separate systems. So once we get them integrated, that's when we're going to say, look, I've already got so much at the store. Maybe let me, I, I don't need to stock for a false internal service level that we had set at the warehouse. So that's where we see more of the value come in. And we haven't seen it yet because we're right at that edge of final validation and implementation. But that's what we expect. Any other questions? Yes. There was a, the question was about master data cleanup before our implementations. Uh, that was definitely a key focus. That's why some of our implementations look longer or took longer. Uh, there was a lot of effort to, to clean things up. And that's where at the user group we talk about uh, making sure the data validation is done correctly and the data is, is clean and in the right format. But that's where it's beneficial to have learned from multiple implementations before such that when we go into the kickoff or even the pre-work, we've done this assessment and we know whether or not they have the right data. But for one business, it took them six months. It got delayed six months because they had to go back and clean up all their data. They had a lot of the SKU aerospace. The SKU at the ASC is different than the SKU at the warehouse. So we had to kind of push off that implementation until things got cleaned up. Any further questions? It's, it's loading monthly, and our, our challenge before was, and I, I will say SmartOps was great with us. They really responded well. Uh, we, then, you know, we initially were concerned, okay, you've got all, this, all these SKU locations going into a model. How long does it take to run that optimization? Um, then we looked back and said, okay, we've got to take a look at some of these assumptions. So we work closely with the SmartOps team on daily, almost every other day calls with, with our our IT organization, they work through. And some of those changes uh, that you've seen in the latest version have corrected a lot of our, uh, what were performance issues in the past. Uh, it's really only for the stores business because that was the most complex. Every other business is running fine, actually better with the latest release. So I want to thank uh, uh, the SmartOps team for helping us uh, work through those challenges and the IT team. Okay.